Hello, and welcome to The Mind of a Therapist, a podcast where I interview psychotherapists and helping professionals and what they're passionate about in order to provide you with messages of encouragement and hope. I'm your host, Andrew Earle. The Mind of a Therapist is sponsored by Psychological Counseling Services, healing hearts and transforming lives. Look into our intensive at pcsearl.com. Before I introduce today's episode, I just wanted to say thank you for listening to the podcast. I appreciate your support, and I wanted to extend an invitation to reach out via email and let us know at themindofatherapist uh, at gmail.com what episodes you've been enjoying, uh, what sort of interviews you'd like to hear, um, any questions that you'd like me to ask a a future therapist, and um, also brief uh, reminder if you haven't listened to any of the other podcasts with my grandpa I call my grandpa cuckoo uh, so I thought I'd let you know that in today's interview I interview my grandpa Dr. Ralph Earl Dr. Earl is a noted family therapist psychologist author and lecturer he is past national president of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy and is an approved supervisor for the American Association of Sex Educators Counselors and Therapists He is a national authority on sexual addiction with over 50 years' experience working with sexual problems and works extensively with sex offenders. Dr. Earl is an ordained minister and served on the board of directors of the Interfaith Sexual Trauma Institute of St. John University, Minneapolis. Lastly, he is the founder and president of Psychological Counseling Services in Scottsdale, Arizona. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Ralph Earl. Cuckoo, welcome, welcome to the podcast today. Happy to have you back again. Um, and to get one one question I had maybe to start off with is, yeah, I've always known that you were president of um, uh, AAMFT for a period of time, and I'm wondering how how you got into that. How what led to your involvement of uh, AAMFT? Yeah, thanks. That's true. Really- a, that's an interesting question to me because uh, my first profession, as you know, Andrew, I was minister of a church and had uh, gone to four different seminaries and was an ordained minister and ministers, whatever faith, uh, interfaith, deal with families. And so I had always had an incredible love trying to help families to do a better job and be more effective in communication and uh, the field of marriage and family therapy was very new and uh, provided an opportunity to be what I look at as the pastoral part of being a minister, whether rabbi or whatever faith it would be, to deal with families in terms of at, when families are in pain or marriages in pain, individual in pain to be able to help. And when I worked on my PhD, um, my dissertation was in family therapy. And while I was working on my PhD in the late 60s, discovered that I could do full time the part of ministry that meant the most to me. And that was the count called pastoral counseling, the counseling part of it. And uh, that led to getting involved in AAMFT, the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, because it was the premier and really the only show in town and on a large level in the country at that point in terms of marriage and family training. So that excited me to be able to keep ministering to families. Mm. And I'm curious, in, in the 60s then, when you were studying marriage and family therapy, what, what were some of those... Uh, texts that you were reading what are, what are some of the ideas that were uh front and center at that point because i know the field was was evolving at that point yeah it's it, it made common sense to me that uh that if somebody was hurting in the family that uh, the whole family hurt and that's still true mm-hmm. uh, and it back then b- before marriage therapy and family therapy there would be like child guidance centers and, and people would send a, like a teenager maybe for help. And if the teenager changed and started doing better, 
what what was discovered is that the family didn't know how to handle that. There was a disequilibrium, and even though the family would want their child to do better, they would, in a sense, sabotage the success because if it's not the kid, then who's the problem? So realize that the problem is the family or the problem is the marriage. And uh, as you're very well aware, Ed, having just, and by the way, so proud of you, just graduating and getting your degree in marriage and family therapy, it was a new understanding to say we don't need, it's not okay to have an identified patient, mm. whether it's a yeah. marriage and say it's one person, that person is the problem, as if there's a saint and sinner, or in a family to send the kid off for help or, or another person in the family, instead of the whole family looking together at what hurts all of us, how can all of us make changes in order to have the family system be more effective. So it was really the beginning of systemic therapy back then, as opposed to individual therapy and psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, what a what an exciting shift at that point in time, moving from that individual pathology, the problem being the person to the the problem being located in the relationship and the systemic function. Um, and I, I know you've talked about uh, interacting with, you know, a number of the, you know, founders of marriage and family therapy, Virginia Satir, Carl Whitaker. Uh, I think you said you did a, a workshop with, uh, Milton Erickson and I'd, I'd be curious to (laughs) hear a bit about, um, the history of marriage and family therapy with, within Arizona, because I know Milton Erickson was, was based in, uh, the Phoenix area, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the Erickson Institute has been based here and still is. Uh, uh, uh-huh. The Milton Erickson Institute, with Jeff Zeig being a person who commit, kind of took over the era parent. Yeah, going back to the early days, uh, when I worked on my dissertation, and which again was in family therapy, I contacted Virginia Satir, who was, who was uh, some of the listeners, if they're in the field, may know, is called the mother of family therapy. And, and as a, as a student uh, that wrote her and asked her what constitutes being a family therapist or what are the qualities and mm-hmm. she sent back a letter to me as a student and and uh, said that the that the person qua person is more important than techniques she said everybody can learn techniques uh, because there are a lot of different techniques going on in terms of the field emerging but the, the person at the very heart and soul of who that person is in terms of caring uh, was more important. And boy, I certainly discovered that over the years with PCS in terms of hiring therapists. We're a place that has about 27 therapists, and it the, we've definitely validated what Virginia said about it being the person that's really essential and then got to know other other people, as you mentioned, like Carl Whitaker and some of the founders, Mnuchin and people who were involved in starting the field. And that, that back then, it was a matter of like apostles for different points of view um, in terms of training. But at the very heart of it was the caring for families and uh, in, within the field. A lot of sharing of self and in terms of the training of the therapist, so requiring more than used to be the case before then, a therapist to do their own therapy. Uh, Mm. That was a pretty novel idea, really, that in order to be a therapist, you would do the training, get to know yourself more um, in family therapy, look at your own family of origin. Uh, mm-hmm. couples look at your own marriage if you're married to that kind of a thing um, I was president of the state organization here in Arizona from 1977 to 78 and I was thinking about that this morning 44 years ago uh, so again being at a different very different stage than you are and so grateful for how many people now are trained in dealing with marriages and family and not just saying, okay, if we help the individual, that'll solve the problem. And that's certainly not 
the case when it comes to couples therapy and family therapy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm curious how that influenced you as a, uh, a therapist in training, reaching out to Virginia Satir and uh, receiving that response of, you know, it's, it's more the, the person versus techniques. What, what was, what, what sort of impact did that have on you at the time and how you developed as a clinician? Well, you know how to ask the right questions, Andrew, because I think that as uh, back then as a minister, I I believe that in terms of what what does it take to be a minister? Well, again, I'm very interfaith, priest, rabbi, whatever. <laughs> that the quality in the Catholic tradition, there's it's called formation of the individual. Uh, the, the, that the end of, that who I am as a person is was very central theologically, biblically, in different faiths, uh, and so that trans that transferred really well into the therapy world for me so that family therapy made a lot of sense. By the way, Virginia Satir, I remember people used to ask me when I was new in this field, as you are now, what's your, what's your modality? And uh, it, for me, it was always relationship centered therapy. Well, that's what Satir was about. Um, I had the opportunity of doing co-therapy with her and, uh, we did a lot together over the years, and her central message was reaching out and caring for families so that people in therapy actually experienced existentially what it was to be cared for by their therapist. Uh, mm. Throughout the years, that's been a central thing in research in terms of what, what really makes a person an effective therapist, that being the bonding or joining with individuals. Nobody did that better than Virginia Satir. So being uh, mentored by her was an incredible experience that way. Mm. And you've been practicing how long, Cuckoo? How many decades is it? (laughs) Well, okay. I I was uh, minister of church for 12 years before 1970. Uh-huh. And uh, from 1958, uh, so pastoral counseling, and then got my dissertation, got my dissertation, did my dissertation, uh, and finished my PhD in 1970. So then full time from 1970 now, I've been a therapist. And uh, I, I, though I've told you, Andrew, that I, I am very biased. I can't think of a more exciting thing to do than to be able to help individuals, couples, families, find out what it really means to be good at, at not perfect, to be to improve in the quality of relationships with people around them as well as with themselves. So um, a lot of years. So I yeah. feel really blessed that, yeah. that, that to, to have been able to be able to do that that many years and at PCS, Again, we're having 26 or 27 therapists who work with so many others, including the privilege of working with your dad, who is our clinical director for now for 33 years, approximately. Um, it's it's a hell of a good deal. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fit, half a century, Cuckoo, of, of practicing psychotherapy. That's good. And I was, yeah, well, I, <laughs> I was curious there. You you were saying, um, you know, in those earlier years when you were starting as a clinician and you know realizing the importance of that re- relationship centered therapy and 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 taking that spirit of care from Virginia Satir. How how have you maintained that over over the years, that posture of care with with the people who are consulting you. That's interesting question because I actually get as much of an adrenaline rush out of helping people now as I did in the very beginning. Um, mm-hmm. There certainly can be burnout in a lot of fields, including in the therapy world. Uh, I think what the reason that hasn't happened for me is I've never met two individuals who are the same, hmm. identical deal. I've never met two couples exactly the same. I've never met any families exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. all, all, all of our families, including my family, 
has ch challenges that needed to be worked on. And uh, I, I don't see myself as a, as, a, as a scientist primarily or a researcher, but to be able to customize every treatment session and, and because the needs are always different. Uh, so it, 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 it isn't like, oh, gee, one's a cookie cutter kind of a profession, to put it mildly. So I think that, that maintaining interest so that literally it means as much to me now to see an individual or a couple or family as it did when I first started is what uh, keeps me still seeing patients. Your dad must wonder, what the heck's going on? <laughs> it's uh, that many... I just turned 84 and, and, and still, uh, still cooking when it comes to the therapy part. I, I love as much as ever. Mm. Oh, that's so good. And that it reminds me of, uh, Scott Miller's work of feedback informed treatment and how each, yeah, each person is just so unique and what serves one person won't necessarily serve another, even with, you know, similar problems that they're coming with. And so, really embracing the uniqueness of every uh, person, every relational system that you're working with. That seems like it's been a key piece then for you in uh, maintaining that excitement uh, in, in in your work. Yeah, I think that this transition from being a minister to being a therapist, uh, I think that always... For me, it was never the religion, like the code or a dogma that turned me on ever, still doesn't. What turned me on was transformation. And it's terms I grew up with, as a lot of people who are listening grew up with, conversion experience. Well, conversion for me was not about a particular creed converting to, it's always been, how can, my, how can I have a, a more ultimate, meaningful life? How can I convert to that? And uh, if I study one of the persons who helped me a lot, a lot was a guy at Harvard Divinity School named Paul Tillich that talked about ultimate meaning to, to try to, uh, without a perfectionist type of thing, to work with people to figure out what is the most meaningful way I can do my life and meets my value system down deep. Because Andrew... Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that we treat on a regular basis is people go against their own value system. Yeah. <laughs> so they're screwing them. They're, I, I call it nuking themselves. When people go deep in therapy, as I know you're aware now as a therapist, and look at who am I really down deep, and if I am congruent with my wise mind, where does that take me? Well, that's a that's an adventure. Like tomorrow, I'll, I'll be seeing some new people that I've not met before because every week we have new people at PCS doing intensives, and I get to go on a exploration <laughs> with them to help them to be who who they really are, not somebody different than who they are. Mm. Yeah, and it. What have you found helpful? I know that some people. Uh, are are pretty out of touch with the their values and you know it, likely they you know maybe not had places relational context in their lives uh that have been supportive of them you know really getting in touch with their values what what do you find is supportive of people in uh getting in touch with what's important to them the, the, their value system well, that's one of the things that excites me the most as a therapist with people. It excites me the most in my own life. I still do therapy. Uh, my wife and I still do couples therapy. Uh, it's, it's getting in touch with the core part of who we are. And what I've discovered is that when people aren't being congruent with themselves, it creates guilt, uh, frequently creates shame. Uh, friend Pat Carnes calls shame-based personality gets formed by somebody not going by who they are down deep, but at a superficial level, selling out, betraying themselves down deep. So what I've discovered is that that when somebody starts looking at what does it take for me to change 
be what used to be called behavioral modification may still be those words may still be around. What behaviors do I need to modify in order to have integrity? I, I've never seen a patient where that when they went deep wasn't a very important kind of a thing. So the thing we work on one of the most is people keep quit lying to themselves or quit lying in relationships. At PCS, we one of our specialties is dealing with people who have betrayed partners. Well, my number one part question there is in what way has that person betrayed himself or herself, first of all, and then also betrayed partners, maybe family members. Yeah, absolutely. And what you, you said that you're still on this journey, Cuckoo, of uh, the, getting in touch with, with your own value system and uh, the, no pressure to, to answer this and I can edit this out <laughs> if you'd like, but personally, what does what is that evolution, is a big question too, what does that evolution look like for you? Well, it's, no, I love the question. I have no problem, I don't have to edit it out. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I was taught to lie, um, and I'm going to be very specific about that. Both of my parents were ministers. They didn't say, Ralph, lie. They said, Ralph, don't lie. That's what they said. Lying is sin. Don't lie. I grew up in a conservative, evangelical, theological environment. My dad wrote 53 books about in New Testaments. Uh, but what, when I say I was taught to lie, I was taught to be what we call codependent. Please everybody else. Do the, do the right thing in everybody else's eyes. Uh, literally, I remember as a kid, we, when t- TVs were new, that's how old I am, is went from radio to TV, and some people in the denomination I grew up in did, thought TVs were a sin. So my dad, who liked the news uh, and, and wanted me to have some TV, bought a TV, but it looked like a bookcase. And <laughs> I, like under penalty of death, if, if we were... If I ever were to say to some people who thought TV was a sin, hey, that's a TV. Uh, I, I was taught not to, I was taught to hide. Mm. Um, another example is uh, my mother had an aunt who believed we would visit in Burn, Indiana, a small town, and they believed that drinking pop or soda out of a can was not okay because it was too much like beer. So before we would arrive at their house, we got rid of all the, the, the soda cans to, to pretend that we to pretend we were our behavior was different than what it really was. That was not a good training for me. I was taught to hide. Um, and so while the, while the intention was quit lying, we were actually lying. And one of my favorite terms, Andrew, that I use a lot with patients, as you know, is I have a bullshit repellent can and a bullshit button. The bullshit that I was taught that turned out to be hiding, pretending image management, all that stuff is something we work with regularly because one way or another, an awful lot of people do that. They, they project an image that's not who they are. So when people get married sometimes, they marry an image and then find out, gee, the person that's done a great job of image management, but that's not who that's not who they are really down deep. Mm. And what what is what does that look like from you having grown up with that uh, the being taught to lie and that image management? What what has it been like for you to um, step out of that and step more into uh, more of yourself? Well, exciting. It's, um, hmm. by the way, I love that term you just used. That sounds like a good, good book title, more of yourself hmm. that, that, that who I am at the core is not original from my point of view, not original sin, something I was taught, hmm. uh, it, it, that the original goodness, uh, one of our hmm. consultants whom, you know, Marilyn Murray, uh, talks about the original child part. Uh, uh, so everybody who comes to PCS gets taught about original child uh, part that the part that before getting contaminated uh, and that then gets contaminated frequently because of 
all this stuff that's taught and pretending and make, making an image uh, or trying to follow rules that maybe down deep. Like I grew up in a, an environment that said dancing was sin and movies were sin, all movies. And uh, it's uh, and had a dad who was a New Testament theologian and very well respected. And I love the fact that he was a scholar. But, but when I asked him about anger, he said, oh, Jesus wasn't angry. And uh, so, well, dad, I'm, <laughs> what about the money changes in the temple? It's, it's a, that's a sure. story that an awful, lot of, that an awful lot of people know. He was angry. And my dad said, no, no, Jesus wasn't angry. He was righteously indignant. Well, you, you know that Mama, my wife's name is Glenda, that if I said, oh, that was righteous indignation, <laughs> <laughs> I would be a deep cock <laughs> Bad for good reason. Because there's nothing, nothing, right, nothing righteous about my anger. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I, yeah, I love I love Marilyn's concept there that you mentioned about that original child. I know that um, that you know that her work parallels Richard Schwartz's work with like having those different parts of us, and yeah, I really really resonate with that as well uh, personally. Uh, that the, with that concept of um, and in kind of incorporating narrative therapy as well there being all of these um, dominant discourses and normalized judgments, both um, in our society and um, at the familial level. Uh, and those, uh, it, Carl Rogers, too, calls them conditions of worth, right? And so there's just um, so many things that kind of keep that, that inner child uh, from, from really coming out and being playful, being joyful, uh, you know, doing things that we really enjoy. And so, uh, I, yeah, personally that, that, that concept's meaningful, meaningful to me as well as I continue to, you know, deconstruct some of these, uh, societal and family patterns that have influenced me and, and step into, uh, expressing that, that inner child part of, of myself. So I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Hey, Andrew, I, the, I love Richard Schwartz's different parts of, uh, and that's more contemporary. I wasn't, he wasn't around in the beginning with that and, uh, getting people to look at the parts. I mean, all of us are collages. I certainly mm -hmm. uh, dark parts and light parts of me and everybody that we see. And it's to, for, to helping people to help people to know they can make a choice about which part's going to be the majority stockholder vote. I've got a big mm -hmm. deal, but about the, what does a majority stockholder vote or the wise mind say? Which parts do you want to see grow and which parts do you want to keep in remission? Because we all have parts that need, that need to be in remission. And when you mentioned Carl Rogers, on his book on becoming a person that anybody's taken psych has heard about, that, that's what I think therapy is all about, to move frequently from being a production unit. I'm a recovering workaholic, as you know. And, and and doing a pretty good job most of the time <laughs> in that good. area. Um, and it's so in order to become a person as opposed to a production unit and to have the joys of being a person, uh, again, Marilyn Murray's original child, we have people do silly things in group. I'll sometimes ask somebody in, in a setting with a group who's very uptight, to do, how about doing something silly right now? And it's amazing what happens sometimes. Somebody get up and start dancing right in the middle of the room who, who's an engineer and just way out of their comfort level. And as you know, Andrew, we have people go to build a bear and, they'll, and bring, a bear, bring whatever animal is their animal they've constructed, whether or not to put a heart in it, what it says, and, in, and carry that bear for a whole day, introduced to all therapists. Because it, 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 this altered part of ourselves that, that taps into the original child part, the fun, the silly part, is, is an incredibly important part of all of us. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, it was so, so interesting what you said there. You said person versus a production unit. Yeah, it just, yeah. It's, we see a lot of people who are very successful production units <laughs> in sure. other words they, they still live there we, we we see a lot of hope high profile people who who have in, in, 
by the way, now this taps into one of the things I was taught as a kid, what the world sees as success comes out of my background. <laughs> but what the reality is, what most of us, including high achievers, see as successful and their CEOs or whatever, athletes, whatever, they, they, they are accomplishing a lot and still at the very heart, very lonely and very intimacy disabled frequently with people around them. Uh, there's a reason that the saying lonely at the top is out there because it's lonely at the top. If someone who in their achievement, which is a profile, we see a lot of at PCS in order to achieve, I get driven. And in my drivenness, forget what it is to, well, to be a friend to myself and others. Mm. Yeah, I, and I had a, a recent uh, podcast interview with Dr. Gene Combs, and and he was talking about how within this um, capitalist system that we're we're in, everyone's almost their own mini corporation. And I've kind of been thinking about that concept within this conversation of of productivity. We're what, what sort of effects does do do these ideas? have on on our lives and then are we okay with with these effects and and then yeah stepping in if if we aren't you know maybe it's because we really value friendship like you're saying or you know for me it's like stepping into joy and so that's one thing that that i've i've been working on and um yeah i love i love what you're saying there too about how you'll ask people at times to uh an, an engineer i can see an engineer you asking an engineer to dance and uh, <laughs> that 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 would uh, require yeah, well, a lot of courage of most <laughs> engineers, I would say. Yeah, and then actually, Andrew, I don't even ask them to dance. I ask them to do something silly. Do something silly. They come That's up with good. The dance. Uh, okay. So yeah, when, yeah, when, yeah. when I ask uh-huh. them to do something like the child part, when I ask it, and all of a sudden this guy who's who's is very cerebral. Uh, very left brain gets up and does this dance and everybody in the group just cracks up because it's it's, it's, that part uh, as Richard Schwartz said you that part is underserved and 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 doesn't show up often and I've never ever experienced somebody breaking out of the mold and doing something silly that way who didn't land up feeling good about themselves having done it. And frequently others in the group and therapy will clap because, wow, mm. you know, you really are a person. You really are. You have a life kind of thing. Absolutely. Oh, that's good. Well, well Cuckoo, I could, I could keep talking to you for hours, uh, but we're, we're getting to the end of the, the interview here. And I've asked you this question before, but maybe, maybe it'll be different today. What's, what's a message of hope that you'd like to leave the listeners with? Uh, I'm a great believer. Uh, the therapist that I see and your grandma and I see uh, talks about, I went to hear him. He asked if I come in here and speak. And two things that he said really hit home with me. And I believe them, but hadn't one of them I hadn't framed this way. One is he, he, he talked about, his name is Dr. Jim Schulte. So he talked about the evolution of Jim Schulte. I believe in evolution. I actually believe in evolution in two different <laughs> number of ways. Mm-hmm. But the evolution, of, the evolution of all of this, that 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 if we keep evolving, then life has meaning. If, if the evolving is true to who we are down deep, I mean, for, for years, value for clarification has been a big thing in therapy. If we're true to our own values. And then the other thing Jim shared was you can be your own therapist. And I, I tell patients that now. I've, I, we've always wanted patients to use their wise mind for, for patients to realize that the number one therapist needs to be myself for me. Mm, yeah. and, then I, and, do, and then do it in collaboration. Otherwise, you and I'd be out of business, and that'd be okay if everybody was doing great. I would. But, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it'd be to do to be our own therapist, that I can be my own therapist, that I need to listen to the majority stockholder vote down deep in me instead of listening to hostile takeovers, and then do that in collaboration with others so that mm. I have more of an informed informed consent to myself. That Those things turn me on. Absolutely. Well, what a great message to end on. 
And um, we'll leave, uh, if people want to get in touch with uh, your work, I'll leave uh, uh, a, a note in the, the show notes, a link in the show notes to your, your books and publications and P- PCS's website. Um, and yeah, thanks for being on the podcast today again, Cuckoo. Hey, well, thank you, Jesus. It's, uh, this is uh, the evolution of you and the evolution of our family with you as a grandson going into the field. Uh, is it excites me greatly. So thanks, Andrew. Please press the subscribe button, as well as rating and reviewing our podcast. This helps others connect with what you've been hearing. If you have any questions, please contact us at themindofatherapist at gmail.com. These questions will be kept anonymous. I want to thank Eric Price for the wonderful music you hear in this podcast. Additionally, this podcast was created to provide accurate and authoritative information on the subject matter. Although we are interviewing licensed therapists, they are not your therapists. This podcast is not intended to serve as direct medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for direct professional help. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, guests, or PCS are rendering legal, clinical, or other professional information. If you need a professional, we encourage you to find one. Visit Psychology Today to connect with a licensed clinician near you.